Hello and welcome to our Resource Nationalism webinar. I'm Andrew Thake, Global Head of Content for Minds and Money. A couple of housekeeping comments before we start. The webinar is scheduled to run for 45 minutes. All registrants will receive a copy of the recording this web of this webinar via email. You can ask questions at any time by using the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. And if you experience any trouble with sound, we recommend that you exit the webinar and then log in back again. For today's webinar, we are joined by the following panelists. John Price, Managing Director of America's Market Intelligence. John is a veteran of Latin American Market Consulting and one of the leading public speakers and thought leaders in the region. Since 1993, John has advised more than 50 of the global 1,000 firms on their business strategies and market intelligent needs in Latin America. Sylvia Nori is a partner with Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. Sylvia is the head of Freshfields International Arbitration, Arbit Arbitration Group in London and the firm's Global Africa Disputes Team. She advises and represents companies and government clients in commercial and investor state disputes in emerging markets with a focus on Latin America and Africa and has particular expertise in disputes arising out of resource nationalism in the mining and other sectors. Emmanuel Yoka is managing partners of Mary's Capital Investments and is president of the Mining Federation of Congo Brazzaville. Um, Mary's Capital Investments is a recently founded private equity and advisory firm based in Singapore. He also works as a country manager for Sundance Resources. And last but by no means least, we're joined by Ludovine Waters, managing partner of Latitude 5. Ludovine is a corporate development consultant and a co-founder of investment and advisory firm Latitude 5, where she's in charge of mining and mining services. With a decade of on-the-ground experience in Africa, Ludovine has in-depth understanding of emerging and frontier markets and the opportunities and challenges they present to companies and investors in mining and natural resources. Welcome to my panelists. Um, so to go and kick off our discussions and our questions, let's, let's talk about defining resource nationalism. So first question to you, John. Can we start by defining what do we mean by resource nationalism in 2019? I, how is resource nationalism we're seeing now different to the post-colonial nationalizations we saw in Africa and Latin America in the 60s and 70s? Sure, Andrew. You know, today we have in place both cross-border investment treaties that protect investors from resource nationalization and a pretty robust international arbitration system that enforces cross-border investment contracts. That said, in recent times, investors have experienced a more subtle format of resource nationalism, whereby host countries continue to interfere from time to time in the operating environment of resource companies by imposing changes to pre-established contracts. Now, politicians continue to draw upon rhetoric um, old rhetoric, but still resonant with voters. Um, in some parts of the world, it, it rings of anti-colonialism. In other parts, it rings of sort of nationalist rhetoric. But generally today, the motive is economic, um, usually because the government is short on cash or because resource prices are high and voters are demanding um, more government resources. A great example of this happened in Ecuador when Kinross was at loggerheads with the uh, Rafael Correa administration over the Fruta del Norte mine going back around eight years now. At the time, Ecuador, a dollarized economy, was in a really difficult um, situation with its, with its dollar reserves. It, we were living at a time of a strong US dollar uh, low oil prices, which is the leading export out of Ecuador, and other low commodity prices that they also export. So that they, are, um, they were in the constant negative terms of trade and their dollar reserves were shrinking fast. It was also a time of high oil, uh, sorry, high gold prices. And even though Kinross had not begun production yet, the government demanded payments right away. Now, they were partially poorly advised because the Ministry of Mines actually belonged to the, was part of the Ministry of Energy, and they were taking a um, peak oil price 
point of view to um, renegotiating uh, mining contracts. And that lack of understanding of mining economics versus oil economics led to a standoff and, and Kinross leaving the country. Um, so this is an example of how combination of bad advice, but really a tough economic situation and high resource prices, in this case, gold prices, led to uh, a form, a modern form of, of uh, resource nationalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Turning to Sylvia, you have considerable experience of the Chavez Venezuelan era. Can you just share your, ex your experiences and what has been the long term impact? So in talking about the Chavez era and the resource nationalism, I think it's important to um, look at the term resource nationalism and, and what we mean um, by that. And as, as John has alluded to, there's a whole um, spectrum of measures that can be taken under that term. And I would say that in the case of Chavez, he uh, really resorted to that whole uh, spectrum, not just for economic reasons, but for uh, political populist uh, reasons. And um, his measures uh, ranged from the more classic uh, expropriations, um, decrees nationalizing assets that he considered to be strategic, obviously including mining assets, but also from oil to, to cattle farming. Um, and he did that uh, in a classic way, sending the army in, in some cases, to take over the premises. But he also, um, I, I think, established what is now the more um, sophisticated course of measures that are taken. Um, and here we see a variety of tools in the armory of states, including taxation, um, which can be Im imposed in a manner uh, that is unfair and arbitrary rather than normal taxation and uh, the use of regulatory power or some would say the abuse of regulatory power to deny and revoke permits and licenses for a variety of reasons and and in the mining sector we saw a combination of all of these um, including uh, the use of unsubstantiated environmental concerns to deny and revoke uh, permits in, in, in certain cases and, and really this trespass beyond uh, the legitimate in, in all cases in, in, in the Chavez regime. And we're seeing uh, the consequences of that now. And the consequences, as, as John has also alluded to, are, of course, international arbitration. Um, and about 50 cases were brought against Venezuela uh, under bilateral investment treaties, challenging uh, the measures taken by uh, Chavez uh, of the resource nationalism variety. And of those, about 20% were in the mining sector. So that's a lot of, uh, of mining cases, some nine or 10 mining claims brought against the, the Chavez regime. Uh, and the result of those arbitrations has been a lot of very significant damages awards, some running to the billions of dollars. Um, and now we're seeing those awards being chased uh, and enforced through the courts uh, globally. So in the interest of time, I'll just give one uh, example of the uh, cases my firm has been uh, dealing with in Venezuela, and that was the Crystalex uh, case, which many of the audience will uh, know well, um, the largest gold deposit in, in Las Cristinas in, in Venezuela. Um, and Chavez uh, announced that he was going to nationalize the mine for the Venezuelan people, but then didn't achieve that objective by sending in the army, but actually first denying an environmental permit and then subsequently revoking uh, the mining permit of Crystal X without any lawful basis. And that resulted in an award of, of $1.4 billion in damages, which is a lot of money, um, which led in turn to Crystal X pursuing an aggressive enforcement strategy against Venezuela's assets in the US. And it, it targeted assets of the state oil company, Pedavesa, which did lead to a settlement agreement at first, but then after the government default, um, Crystal X went back to the courts and has recently achieved a major victory in terms of attaching shares of uh, Pedavesa subsidiaries with key refining assets in the US. So um, this is really where the crunch, I think, comes in terms of resource nationalism, and that is uh, that any um, challenge brought by uh, miners or other investors to such measures must have teeth. Uh, and this is what the teeth uh, is, of course, in Venezuela's case, um, oil revenue keeps the state afloat. Uh, and with the magnitude of claims and awards that are uh, now out there against it, it can't, of course, afford to have all of Pedavesa's global assets up for grabs. So ultimately, it will need to come to the table, um, potentially not under the Maduro, Maduro regime, um, but uh, any new regime will need to come to the table uh, just as Argentina did um, back in the day. Uh, all I will say in terms of impact is for now, the Maduro regime doesn't seem to be changing uh, it, its conduct. Um, more claims are still being filed. Uh, and Venezuela, uh, alongside the DRC, um, is at the top of the resource nationalism index of Maplecroft resource, uh, resource nationalism um, and is one of two countries that's seen as an extreme risk of resource nationalism in this regard. Mm -hmm. So, turning to Africa, Ruvin, it's a common statement that resource nationalism is on the rise in Africa. 
But what's the reality on the ground? How do regions and uh, different countries compare? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, I mean, very clearly, the, the view that African countries have not sufficiently benefited from their mineral resources in terms of sustainable development is very widely held uh, across the continent. And it's, it's very commonly stated in civil society organizations, even by international organizations, which are very active on the continent. And of course, this frustration uh, increases pressure on governments to leverage extractives for, you know, what they term inclusive development, um, or at least to be seen to be doing so. So we all have seen the, the headline cases, um, and, and DRC, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and, and a few others have really grabbed our attention, and they have you know, projected an image of Africa, um, which is certainly worrisome, but I don't think we, I don't think we should be applying that to the entire continent. We're talking about 54 countries and five regions with significant differences. Um, I, I work more in West Africa, for example, and I'm, I'm quite happy to report that in rankings, for example, like Maplecroft, um, every single country in West Africa is categorized as low to medium risk in 2019. But more importantly, there's been little change in that position in the last three to five years. So um, that, that really matches my experience across that region where we really have seen governments conducting you know, regulatory reform and in, in some cases even renegotiating certain transactions but always with a certain view to striking a balance between um, investment attractiveness and maximizing positive impact. So there's, there's also um, a, quite a collaborative or at the very least a diplomatic relationship between the industry and the mining departments um, that, that oversee these, um, these operations. In practice where we have really seen issues arise and some of them you know last for many years it's with tax and customs departments um, which are more inclined to take very rigorous positions and sometimes that escalates into long-winded di disputes with mediation and or arbitration um, th that being said i mean even in one of the most notable cases in mali the very same company that was Rangold that was you know, is still currently in dispute about uh, back taxes. You know, last year at the very same time, they were able to obtain from government a, um, a tax break in relation to new investment. And mostly they've always carried on operations undisturbed. So there's, um, there, there's definitely, uh, you know, the same trends as everywhere else in sub-Saharan Africa or even globally. Um, in terms of, of increasing of taxes, increasing of state control, um, you know, increasing requirements in local content and CSR, and generally a reduction in exonerations and special benefits. But because these have never been conducted or implemented in a way that really stops operations or investment, because the validity of existing title um, and more importantly, the previously agreed uh, tax stabilizations have never been, you know, put in question. Um, I think West Africa is faring not too badly in terms of the of the resource nationalism issues in general. So let's just be careful not to tar the whole continent with the same brush, so to speak. <laughs> um, Emmanuel, you've been involved with Sundance resources and the Congo Brazzaville. What challenges have you seen when operating there? Well, thanks, Andrew. Uh, uh, well, there are obviously plenty of, of challenges and they're not specific to Sundance or to the Republic of Congo. I suspect many companies or countries uh, will share some of the key challenges that I will mention now. And it really starts with poor governance. Uh, it, you also have to deal with the, uh, the lack of infrastructures, both for transport and, uh, and energy and also the limited technical knowledge of mining projects, given that it is a new industry for Congo Brazzaville. 
So the fact that the country clearly suffers from the Dutch disease syndrome due to the significant role played by the oil and gas sector makes things very difficult for mining operators. Uh, in addition to that, the World Bank has sponsored workshops for the Ministry of Mines to review its 2005 mining code uh, because effectively the bank believes uh, the code is too favorable to investors. Now, draft copies of the new proposed mining code were provided uh, to our mining federation. And what we found was not only that the new code is not business friendly, but it also gives two years uh, to existing mining conventions to implement changes, completely ignoring the stabilization clauses contained contain in those conventions. So for Sundance, it is a little bit different because we managed to get our mining convention ratified by parliament and promulgated into law. So in theory, we should uh, the, the, the change should not really impact us, but you, you never know. Again, it's very, very hard to predict. Uh, another challenge that we're facing currently is the requirement for transformation uh, with the beneficiation of iron ore. Uh, it has to be uh, beneficiated before exports as local authorities look to capture more of the value in the supply chain. And finally, I will just mention of of course, the local content obligations that has been just mentioned by uh, Ludwig. I mean, it's really, really challenging for us uh, to have to procure all our goods and services locally uh, and due also to the need uh, to have, uh, in terms of the, the, the other issues, obviously the, the need to have a very limited number of expats in the workforce. So that, uh, uh, that's, that's really problematic when you need to recruit the right people at the right positions. And last but not least, another uh, dimension of that local uh, content requirement is that we are now required to make room for local investors into our companies. So that's a proof also uh, equally challenging. So, um, Sylvia, so the countries in Africa are frequently mentioned with regard to resource nationalism are Tanzania and Zambia. Can you summarize briefly what's going on in these jurisdictions? Sure. So Tanzania and Zambia are both in the next bracket down in terms of the Maplecroft Index. They are both seen as very high risk jurisdictions. And what's interesting about this pair, actually, is they're the only two countries whose scores have dropped consecutively over the last three years uh, in this bracket. So they're clearly the, um, the hotspots, shall we say, or uh, ones to watch in terms of risk for uh, miners in particular. Um, obviously, what's going on in Tanzania currently uh, has been the result of the policies of the incumbent president, Magufuli. Uh, who's been in power now for um, some four years and his administration has of course targeted the mining industry among others um, but starting with changes to the mining act uh, in 2017 and then moving on to the sort of more chavez like spectrum of um, of measures which have come in a different variety of shapes and sizes from export bans to arbitrary tax measures big capital gains tax bills for example uh, the revocation of licenses, uh, outright revocation, and also the forcible acquisition of shares. So really a variety of different measures have been used. Uh, one thing I would say, which <clears throat> we did also see in Venezuela, but is, um, it, it is somewhat alarming to see in Tanzania, is, is also that some of these measures have been accompanied by what I would call state harassment, which is investigations, prosecutions, um, police actions, all of which, of course, are intended uh, to exert leverage uh, on investors in the context of potential settlements. So uh, in terms of arbitration, um, Tanzania has not yet been on the receiving end of anywhere near as many arbitrations as Venezuela has. Um, of course, this audience will be familiar with the Acacia uh, mining dispute, but Acacia is not the only one uh, pursuing arbitration currently against Tanzania as a result of these policies. Um, several other foreign investors are uh, launching or at least threatening um, uh, uh, arbitration. But the good news is that there have been some settlements, including with some high profile foreign investors, and that is a uh, cause for, for optimism. Um, and some analysts are now saying that uh, they're expecting the aggressive conduct of the current administration to potentially cool down a little ahead of um, forthcoming elections. So, so watch this space. Um, in terms of Zambia, um, similarly, analysts have been uh, talking about a clampdown on um, foreign influence in the mining sector for a number of, of years now. And of course, those with a longer memory will perceive here the echoes of history from the 1970s when Zambia's post-independence head of state nationalized mind, uh, mines owned by Anglo-American. Of course, that was uh, the siren um, uh, signal for rallying political support. And this has caused miners in Zambia to be on red alert currently. Um, so far, we have seen uh, the, the, the sort of um, resource nationalism which focuses on tax 
policies, including a mining industry tax audit and some hefty tax bills being imposed. But more recently, of course, uh, as the audience will be aware, we have um, seen Vedanta uh, being specifically targeted with more drastic steps, uh, and that's the current effort to take over the operations of Vedanta, which are based on alleged improper uh, conduct. Um, now, speaking of, uh, of reasons why and motivations for resource nationalism, of course, this is currently being seen as a useful distraction from um, the nation's economic uh, problems. And of course, there will always be an easy target uh, given the current level of, of copper prices. Um, but uh, the state, of course, has been at pains to, to point out that its attempt to liquidate Concola is, is not a nationalization, but a lawful and orderly, pro um, orderly process in view of Vedanta's alleged non-compliance, and this is uh, obviously a, a, a response that states often make to accusations of resource nationalism, but it's fair to say that Vedanta would disagree with that characterization. So it remains to be seen how the, these policies will play out. We've got um, elections coming up in Zambia in the not too distant future also, um, but I, I think we can say that the lessons of the 1970s wave of nationalizations don't seem to have been learned, and Zambia is currently one of the highest risk African jurisdictions for miners. Um, turning back to John and Latin America, which countries are the current hotspots are the current hotspots for resource nationalism in Latin America? Okay, so hotspot perhaps um, nothing quite as alarming as Venezuela as, as has already been discussed um, quite a bit. But in Mexico, investors are concerned not just in the resource space, but in uh, a lot of different areas where foreign direct investment has been strong in that country. Um, President Lopez Obrador, otherwise known as AMLO, cut his teeth politically back in the 1970s when oil prices were high, when he was a member of the PRI party, which uh, governed Mexico for 70 years, and, um, and the national government had unbelievable um, power and influence over the economy in general. And he wants to recreate that to some degree and has tried to rescue essentially Pemex, which is the most over indebted oil company in the world. On paper, it's actually worth um, negative numbers. If they were to privatize Pemex tomorrow, they'd actually have to either give it away or pay somebody to take it. Um, so he's investing as much as $8 billion in downstream refining, which is, you know, a lot of people say it's crazy because of um, the fact that, 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 you know, the use of gasoline and other fuels is in decline over the long term. More, in, more closer to the theme at hand, um, he has begun to question some of the electricity generation contracts that were um, given out in concessions under the energy reforms of the, his predecessor, Peña Nieto. And this is really because um, over thir 13 or 14 private companies began to invest in power generation and selling into the grid using more efficient and clean sources of power than the existing electricity monopoly or pre-existing uh, monopoly, CFA, Comisión Federal de Electricidad. And so the CFE's generation assets are now underutilized um, they're at risk of having to lay people off. And so they're using this as a way to keep CFE viable by calling into question these previous investments, which basically puts a break on any additional private investment in power generation. So another area of concern is mining. Back when um, uh, Lopez Obrador last ran for president, which was two terms ago, and lost in a very close election to Calderon, um, if you recall, Mexico's uh, election was sort of on hold for about six months as the, until the Supreme Court weighed in and decided that Calderon had won. And in that time, um, AMLO built a very popular following. Uh, and there was 10 major um, captains of industry in Mexico that financed a slander campaign against AMLO to help sway public opinion against him. And three of them were mining um, owners, uh, big, big Mexican mining companies owned by wealthy individuals. And so some fear that he has begun to target the mining industry as a way of getting back at those three individuals. And he has uh, done things like uh, imposing um, the right for communities to uh, what they call pre uh, consulta previa, to, to have a 
consultation of the local communities before contracts are awarded. And so this is a way of sort of punishing the mining industry, but it may very well be a personal vendetta more than anything else. Three jurisdictions that are not hot spots right now, but could become so over the next couple of years, Guyana. Guyana has always been friendly to the mining industry, but they've never been an oil jurisdiction until now. One of the largest um, new discoveries is offshore. And uh, in Guyana, you have very um, fiery politics, two major party blocks, each aligned with different um, racial groups within the indo guyanese and the afro guyanese um, uh, aligning in two different parties. President Granger, who leads the um, afro guyanese party, is, uh, has a very narrow majority. And he has negotiated with Exxon. Much of the agreement has been done in secret. And this has become a huge area of uh, political debate. And his party will probably lose the next election. And the next government may very well try to, uh, which tends to be more left-leaning, may very well try to renegotiate terms with Exxon. In Ecuador, um, Rafael Correa is out. His uh, apparent um, ally, Lenin Moreno, came in. But then Moreno turned against him, just like Danilo did against Fernandez in the DR and sent him packing and Korea sort of has promised to come back. Well, we're seeing riots, et cetera, in, in Ecuador right now. That is precisely Korea's um, driving that from, from abroad with money lent to him from different sources, including Venezuela. Uh, it, is, it has forced Moreno to move the political capital to the coast um, temporarily. Now, the concern is that uh, Ecuador has worked really hard to reposition itself as a um, favorable mining investment uh, jurisdiction and overhauled its laws, et cetera, and has begun to attract a lot of interest. But Ecuador uh, has essentially sold its future uh, and plundered its future with uh, through future oil contracts to the Chinese by taking on Chinese debt. So there's not much that can be done to plunder the oil industry, but the mining industry could well become a target um, three or four years from now. And then in Argentina, we'll probably see the return of the Peronists um, at the end of October. And um, again, the Peronists have actually been good to miners, um, but Argentina, uh, like Guyana, has a very interesting oil and gas uh, field called Vaca de Muerto. Uh, that is being developed by uh, Chevron, Nexon, and others, and Shell, I believe. And uh, where I see risk there is not so much uh, renegotiating contracts, but imposing national hiring practices, um, as well as uh, imposing minimal percentage of national content in the terms of equipment and service contracts. Uh, because Argentina, whoever takes over, then whoever wins the election is going to be inheriting a very difficult economic situation. So those are some of the areas to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, John. And then that neatly leads into our first poll of this webinar. And the question is, just coming up on your screens now, is, is resource nationalism on the increase? So on your screen, you should see three uh, choices to choose from, uh, yes, no, or unsure. So we'll leave the poll open for the next uh, minute or so. So I'd please encourage everyone to vote now, as well as obviously send in any questions that you'd like our panelists to answer. Um, just whilst we're waiting for the poll results to come in, perhaps I can ask you, Emmanuel, are we seeing an increase in resource nationalism? Well, I think without a doubt, uh, it is on the increase. And uh, it is happening at a global scale, not just in Africa or Latin America. The, uh, the, the trade war uh, between the US and China, Brexit in Europe, mining changes in Mongolia, Indonesia, all of those are expressions of resource nationalism. Uh, it's actually resource nationalism is evolving a bit like wars and conflicts. There is more of it, but they're becoming less violent. So we see less nationalizations or expropriations, but it has taken the form of creeping taxes, royalty increases, et cetera. And again, if you look at the, uh, the, the latest uh, resource nationalism index from Maplecroft that has been mentioned before, uh, it reveals that last year alone, about 30 countries have displayed some form of resource nationalism or another. 10 of those countries were in Africa, 
So, yeah, and in Africa, it's really easy to see. I mean, the, the, the driver is to that re increase in resource nationalism or political. Uh, governments in emerging countries are becoming more assertive over the national interest. Economically, I believe governments have to make up for uh, budget deficits resulting from the down cycle in commodity prices. And also there is a disconnect between perceived returns and the reality of what mining companies are actually getting. When you, you talk to stakeholders in country, they really feel that, okay, the, the Sundance, the, the Glencore and all the other mining companies operating there are making lots of money and the, the communities are not getting anything. So that's also a big part of the, of the issue. And you can also mention, of course, that there is at a local level or sort of in, in some places, at least in countries like Ghana or other or, or places, you have a, an increase in terms of local expertise. And that is really fueling the review of bad legacy contracts. Uh, so that's a, a, an, an important factor. And finally, I will mention that socially, you also see that the, the, the rise of democracy, I think, can be associated with this rise in terms of resource nationalism, because local communities really feel empowered now, so they can actually challenge their governments, and they're really voicing their intolerance to poverty. So all these factors actually make up for an increase in resource nationalism. Okay, and then just a follow-up question for you, Eve. Manual. Um, actually, we, we, we actually just got the polling results up, and they kind of like back what you were just saying that 73% of the uh, respondents think that resource nationalism is a, is on the increase. But are there any sort of circumstances where you feel that resource nationalism is justified, and if so, under what circumstances? <clears throat> well, I guess it really depends where you ask. Obviously, if you ask for investor, the answer is never, and uh, for government, it is always. So. But if you go by the, uh, the, the United Nations Resolution 1803 passed in 1962, it clearly states that countries have a permanent sovereignty over their natural resources. And when it is done in an attempt to better the lives of communities or the overall the country's economy, I would say it is always justified. And I'm pretty sure that most investors would agree with that. Unfortunately, too often it is seen by local governments as a quick and easy way to squeeze out more revenues from investors, with very little consideration to contract terms. The real problem, in my view, has to do with the way resource nationalism is carried out. It is usually done without any consultation with the private sector or without any financial modding to back up the claim of an unfair deal. So to me, it is not an issue of whether it is right or wrong, but rather of how it is carried out. Mm -hmm. um, Ludovine, you've often said that resource nationalism also expresses itself in regulatory details that often that can often have a more have that can often have more significant impact than originally anticipated. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Just to um, tie in with with also the previous question, um, I think. When we discuss resource nationalism, we, we cannot pretend it exists in a silo. Um, so if there is a conversation about any measure that comes under reasonable resource nationalism um, towards a, a, you know, an improvement of positive impact, I think operators will be very open to that conversation if the counterpart um, is, is a conversation about governance. So when, when we look at a situation where revenue increase is coupled at least as an intention and, and hopefully in implementation with increased transparency and accountability, then those dynamics ultimately become positive for all stakeholders. So it's not so much a justification as a sort of widening of the scope of the discussion, I think. In terms of the, the regulatory details, really what, what I find a little bit dangerous is that you now have um, you know, governments that, uh, as Emmanuel was saying, have their own capacity to review certain matters, um, but they're not always able to really assess over the long term the impact of some of the measures that they, um, they advocate or pass. Um, at the same time, you've got uh, international organizations with development or governance agendas who are, who are pushing for governance-focused uh, solutions, but those are often translated uh, nationally or locally into um, something 
very close to, to resource nationalism. Um, and generally, it's the confluence of all those trends which makes me um, uncomfortable. So a small practical example that we've dealt with recently is um, you have a number of African states, and I think this is also a global trend, that are now adopting a, a royalty base that is not derived from operators' actual revenue, but from a reference to market price. Of course, this is often encouraged uh, by you know, the, the organizations that are seeking to address base erosion and profit shifting. It's very well viewed internally as a guarantee uh, against these unfair deals that, that are often uh, raised in, in the resource nationalism debate. But the reality is, that's a complex measure to implement in some cases, because first of all, not every market price is easily available, nor easily applicable to the specific product that's being taxed under royalty. Uh, but more importantly, once you start to, to look at you know, wider implication, these are the kinds of measures that could cause significant uh, impediment to some of the financing structures that we are now applying worldwide, um, like streaming or pre-export finance. Anything that entails a significant discount to market price as part of consideration for a wider transaction raises an immediate problem in terms of the taxation on, on revenue that is not actually realized by the operator, for example. Um, and, and when you tie that in with the trend of stipulating, which across Africa it's now virtually commonplace, uh, stipulating that mining conventions, for example, can no longer deviate from the model or from the mining regulation. Effectively, the state is putting itself in a condition where it cannot address you know, cases where there would be a, a sound justification to perhaps adapt some of the tax rules or adapt how they're implemented um, you know, for, for a specific operator. Um, and as I was commenting a little earlier to a, a friend, really you've now got you know, mining conventions which are worth only the value of the uh, arbitration clauses that they include because that's what differentiates them from the regulation that they otherwise copy. So um, I think the, the issue here is not with one regulation or one provision, it's the combination, and it's when you look at the long-term implications of that combination that I'm not sure you know, all the consequences have been envisaged by, by government when, uh, when they adopt that regulation. Mm -hmm. um Sylvia, one of your focuses has been resolving international resource nationalism disputes. Can you give us some insights into some of the issues involved? So, obviously, when it comes to disputes, we are talking about um, the, the, the legal um, dispute, and we've had questions around whether resource nationalism can be justified. And, of course, the question is, what, what do we mean? Justified in the court of public opinion or justified in a court of law? And, of course, um, when it comes to disputes, we're talking about a court of law, um, and then we have to look at uh, what the legal rights and legal remedies are uh, of the investors uh, when they are faced with resource nationalism. And, and here, there are two sources, generally, of, of, of legal rights and remedies. One are the contracts or conventions that Ludovine has mentioned already, and um, uh, investors must look closely to those contracts to see if they give them the tools they will need to challenge these types of measures. And by that, I mean not only the arbitration clause, as Ludovine has quite rightly pointed out, is there an international arbitration clause? Because the key here to having a remedy against a state is to internationalize a dispute and have an international arbitration clause. Uh, if you only have a domestic remedy, uh, the state will not be unduly concerned by that. It needs to be internationalized. Um, and the second is if the stabilization clauses. Do you have the, the protection you need to say, um, well, that change can't be made because it breaches my contract? Now, if you don't have contractual protection, the key is whether you can avail yourself of um, international investment treaties, which have already been mentioned, um, and those provide access at international law um, to international arbitration, but only if the investment is structured uh, via a jurisdiction which has a treaty 
uh, with the host state and therefore provides you with that remedy. So, uh, so that's the issue in terms of how you get to internationalize your dispute and put it before a tribunal. The, the other point I would stress here is one that Ludovine has raised, and that is the importance of transparency and what I would call good behavior. Um, so it's all very well having this remedy, having access to an international tribunal to bring your dispute and hold the state to account. But have you come with clean hands? Um, and we're increasingly seeing um, the quite right demand um, that investors should also be uh, uh, essentially looking out for, for, for the greater good, not just their profit. So um, uh, environmental obligations, um, community obligations, etc. Uh, and another one clearly is that they shouldn't have been involved in any kind of corruption or other sort of untransparent uh, and unclean activities in the past. And tribunals will look into this. So, um, so the, 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 I guess the one warning I would give is if you're going to go and get justice, then do so with, uh, with clean hands, because the state will, at the start of any kind of arbitration, and if it hasn't already in, in the course of its resource nationalism, it will start investigations, it will start audits. Uh, and if your house is not in order in terms of your compliance with national laws, um, then you might find that you lose your remedy, that your claim might be struck out or that your damages will be discountenanced because um, you didn't comply with local laws and you haven't come with clean hands. So that's that's one issue I think we're seeing currently in dispute. Mm -hmm. um, Emmanuel, um, I, I want to move on to um, resource nationalism in investment decision making. Um, you're obviously a private equity investor as well. How important is resource nationalism as a factor when you invest? And I guess more importantly, how do you factor resource nationalism into your investment decision making? Well, I think uh, along with the, the expected quality of the resources in the ground and, and, and the infrastructure in country or planned infrastructure to come, uh, I would say resource nationalism is certainly one of our top three issues when looking at an investment. So I would say it is very important. Uh, now, the way we factor that into the decision-making process is by checking whether the local authorities are prepared to agree to carve out clauses in contract and by inserting resource nationalism policies into our base case scenario for our financial model. So no longer do we treat that as a what-if scenario, but we do believe it is here to stay. And so we, we, we really insert that into the base case because we know this is something that's going to happen. Uh, we feel that the sooner we understand that, the better off we will be in the long term. Okay. Um, John, the resource nationalism cycle seems a tributary to what economists call the obsolescing bargain, which sees negotiating power shift from foreign investors to, uh, to host states after investments are made. Is there any practical advice you have for miners and investor, in investors to mitigate the risk of this? Sure. Let me uh, let me draw upon um, anecdote again to provide some insight. So, back in 2004, President Leonel Fernandez in the Dominican Republic inherited a bankrupt country, um, and he really did a great job turning things around. And one of the biggest wins was to attract um, Barrick uh, to make the largest foreign investment in the history of the DR to turn a one of the oldest mines in Latin America through new technology into a viable mine again that would deliver over 20 million ounces of gold. And he structured it such that the construction phase of the mine would impact his the second half of his administration, uh, provide record job growth, uh, which turned out to be a great thing because of course that's when the world economy turned soft. And then he structured it so that Barrick would not have to pay any royalties or taxes until they repaid that initial capital investment, which would deprive the next government, when, he, when his term limit was up, would deprive the following four years of government with any revenue from that project. And he knew that the, or he, he estimated that the opposition would come in and that would deprive the opposition and then that would give him the economic impulse to be reelected come, um, uh, in 2016. Well, what ended up happening was um, his own party actually won in 2012, and one of his protégés, Danilo, took over. Um, but Danilo quietly uh, uh, resented um, Fernandez, and so when he actually took over in 2012 and realized that the Fernandez administration had run the coffers dry and he was in desperate need of cash and he had just promised record spending in education during his campaign, he turned to the one 
asset that was out there that he could plunder. And that was that Barrick had invested at that point $4 billion in the mine, was just about to get it started and operating. And he halted everything. He basically halted all the licenses, et cetera, and created, spent over a million dollars a year uh, through journalists um, creating a negative campaign against um, Barrick and forced Barrick to the negotiating table and basically front loaded over a billion dollars of royalties that were to be paid four years hence that started being paid right away. So this is a great example. Now, how do you mitigate against such a thing? Well, in spite of the great points that were made by Litovine as to the complications of a variable royalty agreement, that is one of the things that can help uh, take off, away some of the political pressure when resource prices are high. In this case, gold prices were high at the time. Another is to bring in a local politically savvy investor. So the DR doesn't have mining companies and it doesn't have much of a capital uh, monetary system, but it does have some very powerful families who have long ago developed political allies with every party and bringing in one of those investors and having them on board with vested interest is one way to help mitigate political risk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm conscious so far we've talked about governments in a slightly sort of negative way, but the, um, but maybe to a manual, um, there are obviously some countries out there that have good mining codes and have a positive relationship with investors. Could you perhaps like talk about a, a few? I think you've mentioned uh, Botswana in the past. Yes, uh, well, I, I think uh, the, the country that comes to mind, yes, it is Botswana. And if you look at the annual Fraser Institute, which surveys mining companies in 83 countries, uh, Botswana was ranked number 12, and it's ranked number one in, uh, in Africa. So it makes it, again, the top destination for mining investors in Africa. And the reason why Botswana is head and shoulders above its regional peers, in my view, is the low level of government intervention into the mining sector. And you also have an even lower level of corruption. Uh, and most importantly, you have a very stable legal framework. So it's not exactly the, 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 the dream place for lawyers because everything's there is so stable that you, you have very, very few cases for, for dispute. Uh, there are many countries which on paper have very nice mining codes, the likes of Cameroon, Congo Brazzaville, Ivory Coast, Mali, all have very nice, attractive terms, such as five-year income tax holidays, low state participation, strong security of tenure over mining titles, good environmental and social benefits. But those terms are really as attractive to the mouse as the cheese in the mousetrap. They're a perfect example of the uh, obsolescing bargain concept mentioned before, because, before that. And, and, and that is why Botswana has been uh, one of the few resource which country that has managed to escape the resource curse because effectively what you see is really what you get and in terms of working relationship with the private sector I think the relationship uh, the, the long-standing relationship that De Beers has had with uh, Botswana is the perfect example of how investors and governments should work together it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to work and it's working in Botswana mm -hmm. um Sylvia uh Manu just mentioned it the beers there. Are there any other is, is are there any other good examples of a of a like a mining company that is working well with governments in terms of responding to the threat of resource nationalism? I, I think most mining companies would like to think they are collaborating well uh, with the government because it is imperative that everyone does that today. Um, I don't think I could uh, single out one particular um, mining company if I'm being honest. Okay. Um, turning to Ludivine, um, what are the potential hotspots for government and jurisdiction risks in Africa in 2020? Um, well, well, clearly the, the current hotspots um, will continue to attract attention, I think. Um, and they seem to have embarked on a spiral of conflictual relationship with their mining industry. Um, I, I think really where the possible risk lies is sort of a, a contagion effect across borders. Um, so I'm, I'm really now looking at regions where um, local population may be pushing for what they 
think has been a success in a neighboring country um and 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 that may create you know a whole new wave of, of pressure in those countries so i'd really say neighbors of uh of the jurisdictions that are currently um you know facing these issues or creating these issues okay we've um we're just running a little bit short of time so we've got time to take a few questions from the audience um, one question that was sent in earlier, um, a few of you, I think, mentioned the um, Maplecroft has been a good sort of like measurement of resource nationalism. And the question coming in, I think it's from a mining company, was is that the sort of best way of, of a sort of metric of, of measuring resource nationalism? Or are there other sort of companies out there that offer similar metrics? Maybe shall I start? I mean, for me, the Verisk Maplecroft Index is the most comprehensive one because it's extremely dynamic. It's on a it's on a quarterly evaluation and it's it's a constant tracking. Now, there's again coming back to this issue of the the necessary link between resource nationalism and governance. Um, I think it's it's worth looking at some of the governance indexes there. Uh, and in in that regard, there's been a, a very first sort of comprehensive index that's been done by the National um, Natural Resources Governance, um, uh, I think, is an association or institute, um, and and I think those two views are really sort of where you can uh, get the the, the best uh, identification of how things are evolving and possibly. How they can continue to evolve, um, you know, in in the coming months, years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just uh, turning to yourself, Sylvia, do you have any advice on how best to mitigate the risk of resource nationalism down the uh, down the line at the time the deal is made? Yes, I mean there are various ways to mitigate. We've talked a lot about sort of good collaboration, good engagement. Um, transparency, working within the, the laws, being a good citizen. Um, the specific piece of advice I would give um, refers back to something I mentioned earlier, and that is uh, how you can access international arbitration, which at the end of the day is, is where you will be able to hold um, any state measures that are unlawful to account. Um, and here I would say, uh, obviously check carefully your, your, your contracts, as I mentioned, but look to investment treaties in particular. Uh, and um, and take advice from legal counsel as to structuring of your investment. So uh, if you are making an investment um, from a country that has a bilateral investment treaty uh, with the host state, then you will have uh, in the ordinary course the protection of that treaty. But it may be that you are coming from a, a country that does not. And to give an example, the US does not have a bilateral investment treaty with Venezuela, um, yet the likes of Conoco, Phillips, and Exxon were able to bring claims, and that is because they structured uh, their investments at the time via the Netherlands, and at the time there was a bilateral investment treaty between the Netherlands uh, and uh, Venezuela, which enabled them to bring multi-billion dollar claims against the government. So think very carefully about how you can access international law protections, um, and if you don't currently have any international law protection or any access to uh, international arbitration through your contracts, then do think about restructuring to get the protection of um, treaties that exist at the international level. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Sylvia. And I do apologise. We, we haven't been able to get around to all the questions. We've now actually like run out of time. But I should add that uh, Sylvia, Ludovina, and Emmanuel will um, all be at our uh, Minds and Money London event coming up in November. And John Price's colleague Remy Piet will, 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 will actually be attending from America's in intelligence. So once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our listeners for dialing in. Um, if any of you uh, do wish to go and attend uh, Minds and Money London, you are entitled to attend at a discount by using the following code MMLWeb and you'll get a 15% discount. I would also encourage you for more great news and content, please check out our Mining Beacon website at www.miningbeacon.com. And many thanks and see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.